I'm going to start by just reading Scripture out of John 12, starting in verse 20. It says, Now when there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast, then they came up to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. And I, this isn't my message, but like just this, this first part of this scripture. But it leads up to it. You have the way it says it here, these Greeks, which you know, these that aren't the Jewish people, these Gentiles. And they're coming around and, and they're asking disciples, they said, Sir, we would love to see Jesus. And there are people all around, and, and no matter how you think about it, you think like, ah, oh, it's everybody you know, I come in contact, doesn't want to know who Jesus is or whatever, but deep down, really in their heart, I believe each and every one is crying out saying, I want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus. In verse 23, but Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat, so Jesus is like, he heard them, right? There's people that want to see you, Jesus. And, and, and they didn't really understand all of what he was saying, but he was trying to, to get something down in them because the time was about to come. Like he said, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, verse 24, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him, my father, will honor. So you have this moment, and it seems like Jesus is kind of like, they come and say, there's people that want to see you, Jesus. They want to come and be, you know, in your presence. And, and, and they've, they've seen the things that have happened and want to come to know you. And, and, and it seems like Jesus is just like, let me tell you a story that seemingly has nothing to do with these people coming to see me. Or, or that he's pushing them off. But it's not the case and in reality, he's giving them something and telling them really what needs to be fulfilled in order for these Greeks or the Gentiles or everybody else to be able to see him. He says, I'm on, I'm on my way to glory. I'm going to be glorified. I'm, I'm, I'm in this process and, and you may not understand it. But you're going to have to see it to believe it. So you might not like what it looks like is happening, but this is what needs to happen in order for me to be glorified, in order for me to be able to become not become, but, but to go back to my Father, to, to be who I am. So 
So he says in verse 24, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it must, or it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces, produces much grain. I'm going to give you a little science lesson here. Um, because I'm a substitute science teacher in my house. Um, <laughs> but I was looking about, you know, Jesus uses these words, and you're like, wow, that's, that's amazing. It's got this, you know, symbolism of wheat and being planted in the ground. But do you realize, and I love watching people like Louis Giglio that's like, I don't know how he does it, you know, and talking about all these cells and things and the body and how they represent or, or have a picture of Christ and the cross. And it's like, I'm like, oh my gosh, how do you do that? Anyway, that's a side note. But in this, I, I just wanted to look at what, what is the, the wheat, you know, that he's talking about? Like, what is it? And, and is there more meaning than we generally get just by reading that scripture, okay? And listen to this. When a wheat stalk grows, it grows up, right, on the stem and then produces this head or this cone. But in order for, for the process to be complete, the stem actually terminates in order for the wheat to grow hard. So in, in, unless the stem terminates, and I just picture that, and I'm thinking like, man, I think about how we grow, you know, we grow up, and, and, and we're strong, and I'm standing tall, you know, right, I guess. But to think that, am I standing on my stem, am I relying on who I am, holding myself up, you know, I'm supposed to be a grain of wheat, but do I feel like I'm holding myself up or am I going to allow myself to be terminated, to fall to the ground so that I can produce the fruit, the fruit that needs to be produced? I have to terminate self. I have to terminate that, that standing on my own two feet Trusting in me, in what I can do, in order to produce fruit. Otherwise, I'm just going to be alone. Right? It says that would, they'll just stay there alone. One stalk a week, doing nothing, producing nothing. It'll stay there if it doesn't fall to the ground. But then you take the shell, the wheat. And there's three parts to it. The first part is the bran. The outside part is called bran. It's the shell. And it's basically just a hard, crusty part on the outside that gets hard when it's terminated from the stem. And then a big part of it is the, bran, is, uh, is the endosperm. The endosperm is, is a major portion inside. I say it's not this big, but I'm going to make it bigger so you can understand what I'm saying, Okay but a major portion inside that bran or that shell. And then you have the wheat germ, which is down there at the bottom, this little bitty piece at the bottom. And I was thinking about this and going along with my message, I'm like, oh my gosh, Jesus knew what he was talking about. Can you believe that? Like he knew what he was talking about. Because this wheat, has these elements that are very similar to the elements that we have. We have the body, we have the soul, and we have the spirit. The body is the shell. The soul is the, um, what I call it, the endosperm. And you know what the endosperm, is? so funny. Okay, I'm not going to get there yet. The endosperm. And then we have the wheat germ, which is the spirit in us. Right? Body, soul, spirit. The body is that, that shell that protects the, the insides, right? The soul and the spirit. And then we have the soul, which is really, we really think is big for us. 
You know, it's, it's, it's who I am. It, it's, it's all the, the product of my upbringing and, 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 and my creation. And who, this is me. This is my soul. This is my life. But do you know that that endosperm, it's really just a bunch of filler. It's just all the starchy product. That part that seems so much like the life of the seed, uh, the, the, that it is really the whole contents of, of what this wheat seed is, is actually just there to feed the wheat germ. And then you have the wheat germ, which create that which has all the nutrients and all the good stuff in it. And this is the part that's actually going to create the fruit once it dies. So what happens is this little grain of wheat needs to fall to the ground. It says, and die. And to die means it just is terminated. It's dried up. Of course, there's still life in it. But, but the, for the purpose of it, what Jesus is saying is like, it needs to be cut off from trying to sustain itself so that it can fall to the ground, it loses that that softness that it had so that when it falls to the ground, it can seep down into the ground. And then when it does that, you know what happens? The moisture and the humidity begins to crack it. You have the shell, and the endosperm, that filler stuff in there that we think, oh man, this is it. This is who I am. Think about that. That's what we feel like. My body and just like who I am. That's it. But what Jesus is telling us, he's saying, <laughs> saying listen, there's a spirit in there that needs to come out. There's a spirit in there, the real you, the one that I've created to bear fruit that needs to come out of you. And in order to do that, in order to do that, you're going to have to fall to the ground. In order to do that, that shell and that stuff that's around, right, that filler, that soul, if you will, You know what happens? That gets eaten up by the Spirit. It has to force its way. The Spirit forces its way. The wheat germ forces its way through the endosperm. And and it helps it to build as it's pushing through. And then we see this little wheat germ turn into a plant. Maybe a little seedling. And then the seedling turns into a plant. And then the plant starts to bear fruit. And that happens because of the spirit or the wheat germ in that seed. We need our wheat germ to bear fruit. So what I want to talk about today is are we willing to Take the termination. Are we willing to fall to the ground? Are we willing to be broken? What we feel like is who we are. Are are we willing to allow God to break that in order for His Spirit, for the Spirit that He has created in us to come out? Because that's we pray all the time. All the time. God, will you do this in my life? Will you, will you use me? Will, will you just create in me this, you know, uh, just desire to do your will? And then all of a sudden these things start happening that are hard, that are going to break us, that are, that, that are difficult. That it's just like, why is everything pushing down? God, I ask you to, to, you know, to make me fruitful. In this, this book, oh my gosh, by Watchman Nee called The Release of the Spirit, there's a, a lot of things that I've pulled out of there in this message, but 
<laughs> oh my gosh. He Um, man. Are we willing? Are, are we willing? To allow God. To crush us. Like, what? God wants to do that? Well, He doesn't want to kill you. He wants to crush you. Because He wants to produce something in your life. We want the, pro the, the produce, but not the punishment, right? We, like, we want the thing that comes after the crushing, but we don't want the crushing. And I feel like so many times in my life, in all of our lives, we, we want what God has created us for, but we struggle getting past the things that we think or how we want to do it or the pride or the selfishness or any of these different things. And, and we won't allow God to break those, look, the, the, the brand, the, the shell, it just, it has to be broken off. They just get that stuff off. That's not where the good stuff is. But so many times we want to protect the shell. We want our shell to be whole. Man, this hurts, this hurts so bad. You know, something's hurt and our soul is hurt. We feel like, I just don't know if I can come back to this. But do we realize that if we allow God to come and actually press on it, to press through it, say, God, why, why does it feel like this is, you know, I, I want healing, but you're asking me to, to, to rethink about these wounds and these hurts and this stuff. And I don't want to think about that. I want to just close it all up. And he says, but I want to press through it because there's something inside there that needs to come out. And you need to break that stuff off. If you just close it up, it's going to stay there. So... So Jesus is explaining this thing to these guys, you know, about, about the, the, the grain of wheat that needs to fall. And he's talking about himself. He's saying, this is what needs to happen in order for me to be glorified. He says, but then I want you to join me in this. I'm showing you what, what I'm going to do so that you can follow me in it. And he goes on in verse 25. To explain a little bit more. And he says, he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him, my father will honor. So this word, life is actually, I mean, I don't know if this is actually how you pronounce it. I think they pronounce it in the Greek. It's like suke. But it's psyche. This word life is spelled out like psyche. And it means the soul. So when he's saying whoever wants to save his life, wants to keep his life, he who wants to protect his own soul, and wants to keep it intact, and wants to keep it full, and, and, and I don't want anything to happen to my soul, that he's going to lose it. When? For eternity. And he who wants to, or 
But he who hates his own soul, he who will allow his soul to go through the process of dying, the one that will allow God to do this work in him and break through that mess of a soul that you have in order to get to the wheat germ, that spirit to break out. And in that book, by Watchman Nee, he, he explains it like a, he says you have the, the inner man, which is your spirit. And this is what brings out, of course, all kinds of scriptures in it. Inner man, which is your spirit. Your outer man, which is your soul. And your outermost man, which is your body. He says that spirit is in there, just like that seed. But our soul and, and, and our body are wrapped around it. And, and it's like a protection and it feels like a protection. But he said what we don't understand though is that those things, that, that soul and that body, those things, if we allow them to stay intact, if we don't allow God to move and to break through that soul, that that spirit will not break through in order to produce fruit. So Jesus says, if anybody hates his life in this world, if you allow him to work on and crush and, and just mess up your soul, like it, it doesn't feel good. God, why you got to do that? It hurts. Why, why you got to mess me up like that? You know, and sometimes, you know, even the things, like we think, like, why is, why is this thing, this can't be God, right? Why can't it? When we ask God to do something in us and then there seems to be an attack, that's not God. I, I mean, I can't say whether it is or not, but why can't it be? God allowing something to happen on the outside to bring you to a place of, of repentance, to bring you to a place of of, of breaking the control that you have on your life or, or that selfishness or that pride. Why can't that be God allowing that to happen? Second Corinthians 4.10, it says, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. When it says this, I always carrying about the, the dying of the Lord Jesus, and I, I know, you know, there's meaning of, uh, of understanding and remembering what the cross was to us and what it did for us. But I think there's also, just like Jesus kind of laid this moment out for these disciples, and he said, with the wheat and the hating your own soul, that in that we're supposed to follow him in the dying, that we die to self, that we will allow him Allow Him to do that work that makes me smaller and Him bigger. See, it's hard. But it's also glorious. And I love that. I love, in this scripture, you see a few things. He says, if a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies... You got to die. But if it dies, it produces so much grain. See, there's something that's hard, but there's something that's so glorious that's tied to that hard thing that he's asking us to go through. In verse 25, if you hate your life, that's hard. That's a hard thing. 
But if you hate that soul so much that you'll allow, like you're not protecting it from God and you're allowing God to do that work on your soul and crushing it so that the spirit can come out of you and just flow out. He says, then you'll keep it, not just for right now, but for eternity. That is glorious. He says, if you serve me, nobody nobody wants to be a servant, right? And God's not trying to be a slave master, just to rule and slave over you. But are you going to follow him and do what he says? But he says, if you serve me, my father will honor you. It's hard, but glorious. There's honor in it. So many times we want to bring honor ourselves. But Jesus says, if you will serve me, then I'll bring honor to you. And my honor is so much more than you can get yourself. We know what we're asking for. So, you know, in this, you you know, like I say all the time, I mean, I I feel like these messages so much are speaking to me, and I, as well they should, when I share them. But I, I just, I feel like I want, you know, I feel like God's done a lot of great things in my life. And I know we probably all feel like that. But you know what? I I don't know that I feel like there's been that place of God just breaking through to see the, the fruit that is just so exponential from my life. And I know we sit here and say, oh, yeah, I've been to church and I grew up in church or I've been here for 10 years or I know God in the past five years and I love him and all these different things. And, and that's, that's amazing. I've known him my whole life, too. And this word isn't for really, I mean, it is, but it's not, it's not for those that are out there that don't know him. This word is for those that know him. The ones that say, oh, yeah, I'm a grain of wheat. And I'm producing fruit, but they're still standing on their own stalk and haven't even fallen to the ground in order for God to actually use them. And you know, we were at this conference, what was it, two weeks ago, last week, and You know, there was this moment, and if I could just wrap it up, it's so hard, but I felt like God was just doing something in me and breaking something and releasing something in me, and and I felt like, oh my gosh. Like, yes, God, I've been serving you. Yes, I've been following you, but I've actually been holding on to something. I've actually been holding on to the, to the let's see, how, I, how can I explain it? Wanting to understand something before you do it. Not wanting something to happen that I've seen before that kind of turned out negative. You know, and some of these things aren't necessarily bad, but the problem is if I'm holding on to them, or if we're holding on to this thing, this question in our mind, what we're doing is we're holding ourselves back from God actually breaking through to do what He really wants to do. And God said, are you going to just let go? Are you just going to release it? And 
doggone it, if somebody in that conference didn't say, are you willing to see the weird in order to see the wondrous? And I was like, no. And the guy was like, really? I said, well, God, if it just looks like this and not this and then, you know, like he, he was talking specifically to me. And I know, you know what's funny? As I told somebody that at the conference, I was like, I know, because people will tell me this. That word was just for me. They've said that to me before. And I went up there and I was like, I know people say this, but that word was just for me. <laughs> you know, I don't care if anybody else was here. It was just for me. But are we holding on? Are we just... Look, I told Tori when I was talking about it, I I said, I I feel like I I just... I pointed at her because we were talking about it. That was the only reason. That... that, Oh, stay together, Bible. Um, Like, I feel like there was just a release. That God released something, that I released something, that there was just a a big amount of release. She's like, oh, that's interesting. It's like, what? It's like, well, actually, I was just looking through a notebook, and we, you know, I'm not really one to do like words at the beginning of the year, but we did them. And the word that I wrote down that I didn't really understand was release at the beginning of this year. And it was just a confirmation, right? I mean, God was going to do it, but a confirmation that God's been working on me, (laughs) you know? But are we going to allow him to do that? You know, not not that we can control God, but we can can control God in our lives, right? He doesn't want to force us to do his will. He wants us to fall at his feet and, and say, God, break me. God, do something in my life. Do I'm willing to go through whatever to have what you want for me. Will you do that? I want for the seed to actually sprout. I want for it to actually grow fruit. But we need to be broken. In Mark 14, 3, it's another story about being broken. And it says that, and being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of every, or of a very costly oil of spikenard. And she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? So many things. Let me finish the scripture. For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. (laughs) First of all, They were mad that she poured oil over his head. That is not part of my message, but that gets me. That they were upset. That this oil was was broken open and poured over Jesus' head. But listen, this, this alabaster box or, or flask or jar, I was looking these up too, right? Because you like, what exactly is it? Of course, it's this beautiful box or jar or flask, but you know what? They had to be sealed up. It's like one of those boxes with the lids that don't go on tight, you know? They just kind of like sit on top. But they would seal it up, and it had, and whether it was a jar or, or a box, and they would seal it up. And it had this costly perfume in it. And it was sealed up. And she spent so much money on this 
alabaster box with this perfume in it. And in this moment, she saw that sitting at the feet of Jesus, being there with him, was worth more than anything in the entire world. And she said, I have to do something. I I have this fragrant oil. I want this oil to be poured over my Savior's head. I want want the smell to come out of this box. I don't want it to just sit on the shelf. But there were some who just valued the box and, and what it was worth, not thinking about the, the fragrant oil that was in the box. They'd rather keep it sitting on a shelf, looking at it, saying, yep, there's fragrant oil in there, never smelling it at all. Wow, I paid so much for this. I can see it. I can look at it. It's beautiful. It's, it's right there. But never opening up, never breaking. So you had to break that thing in order to get to the oil. Just like that. They didn't, they didn't want the box to be broken. They didn't want the oil to be poured out. Again, in that book, it says, oh gosh, I wish I had the book so I could remember exactly, but it says too many have become antique collectors. Something of that sort. Collecting the alabaster jar. Never, never opening up and allowing the fragrant oil that, that is held in it to come out. And in this whole message today, or the whole point of it is, is that there's a fragrance in us. There's something that God has created us for, to do, to be, to show to those around us, but we've never allowed that to fully come out. We don't want to break the jar. But God says, I I want people to smell the fragrance of who I am. I want them to smell. I want them to see. I want them to know. But how will they know unless that jar is broken? How will they know unless that seed is is allowed to die, is allowed to to be broken so that the, the, um, the wheat germ can can break through so that the Spirit can break through that self, that crust, that whatever it is in us that we're holding on to. Will we allow Him to do that work in us? To break the shell. To break the shell so His Spirit can flow through us. To to, to break the control, to break the, the pride, to break the fear. It can look like so many different things. And we say, God, I'm, I'm doing what you want. I'm, I'm doing your will and not realizing, but we're still holding on, just like me. That we're holding on to something. And we're keeping his spirit under wraps. Will we allow him to break us? Will you stand with me and the team could come up?